KX. I used to lurk here a bit back, but I've come back to share my paranormal experience that, up until recently, I hadn't really thought about. If you're looking for a scary story, this might not be what you're looking for, but it is a bit weird, I guess. I've never been great at green text or writing in general, so sorry in advance about that. Be me, around 10 to 11 years old, living in a middle class broken family, the kind I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Alcoholic mother, hardworking father away from family, often due to work, and a few siblings. For sure not the ideal family, but nothing worth getting pity for. The story starts on a particularly bad day for me, where I was bullied pretty hard in school. I also was super introverted and had pretty much no friends there, which didn't help. Like usual, I came home to my drunk mother. The house smelled like cheap wine and smoke. I can't remember why, but she was pretty angry at me and ended up whacking me in the face with a wine bottle. This set my older brother off and he and my mom got into a shouting match where some pretty harsh things were said about us. I took the situation really poorly and being a stupid little kid, I decided to run away. Now, for a little more background, behind my house was a large expanse of forest. Not too far out was an abandoned campground where lots of the local kids would hang out in. It was an old RV park with a couple dozen structures that were left behind. Some of the areas were a bit sketchy, and only a handful of kids explored the whole place. My older brother being one of them, drew up a map of the place. It wasn't great, but it was readable. Taking the map, I left in the middle of the night. There was a lodge I passed once before, and I thought that would be a good place to hold out. Looking back, I'm surprised how stupid I was to do something this dumb. I was super familiar with most of the area, and only really need the map for like the last half or so mile, which that probably helped quell any fear that I felt. I ended up walking three or so miles. I have a very vivid memory of arriving there. It was a cloudless summer night, so the moon and fireflies made it surprisingly colorful. It was isolated enough for it to only be damaged by the overgrown plants, which were at their height in summer. I went in and started up a fire and cooked up some beans from a can. Despite the fire, I was cold inside, and I could even see my breath. The night sounds were louder than I was used to, and I was put on edge. Remembering a ladder to the roof that my older brother made the first time I passed the lodge, I decided I could sleep better up there, where it may be warmer. I found an area where the high parts of the wall shielded me from any wind, and I set up a little bed. Up until that point, I was distracting myself pretty well with the adventure and nature, but... Everything from the day just hit me really hard as I was trying to go to sleep. Looking back, I feel like I was a bit of a crybaby. Your mom hit you in the face with a wine bottle. Anyway, as I was sobbing, I felt on edge again. I was really cold. I never came closer to pissing myself when I heard the sound of creaking on the stairs. I didn't pull it onto the roof with me because, what, a deer was going to climb up and mug me? I was pretty sure I was screwed. I was warned about pedophiles and other degenerates who might be lurking back here. And I wish I could say I bravely pulled out my knife to stave off the threat, or at least that I ran over to the ladder and pulled it up. But I just continued to sob, now covering myself with a blanket. Either from the cold or fear, I was shaking so much that I'd been seen right away by anything that came up on the roof. The stepping became clear as they started moving on the roof, and I pretty much accepted my fate. I felt two arms wrap around me, understandably giving me a heart attack. To my confusion, though, they were surprisingly soft and gentle. Whatever was out there was hugging me from behind through the blanket. It felt like it was in my head, but I swear I could hear cooing. I never felt so content before in my life. For a minute or so, I just sat there, conflicted between the secureness from the hug and my adrenaline spiking. The moment I felt the arms come off of me, I snapped back to reality and threw the blankets off of me. I looked around and I saw no one. I was in fight or flight mode and didn't even question where whatever it was went. I launched down the ladder head first and sprinted home the fastest I ever did. The moment I passed the tree line, I threw up. 
and collapsed from sprinting three miles. While lying on the ground, my brain started to realize that the whole situation didn't make sense. My fear was replaced with curiosity as I continued to think about it. I caught my breath and I eventually went home. It was pretty late, so I climbed through one of my windows that had a broken lock and screen to avoid making noise. And for the three hours I had till I had to wake up, I slept like a rock. The only reason I could wake up is because I was dragged out of bed by my brother. It was a Friday, so I felt a bit better about going to school. This might not be relevant, but most of the kids seemed to treat me coldly, and this lasted until I left my school district for high school. That might have been because of my exhaustion or something, but I remember that they wanted nothing to do with me. The only kids who would even interact with me were the ones who were messing with me. Halfway through the day, the teacher's pet threw some of his lunch at the back of my head. Like clockwork for some reason, the teacher yelled at me for making a mess. The day was going to shit, and all I could think about was how good it felt last night when I was being held. Between the harassment and cold shoulders, I couldn't wait to go home. Without even hesitating, I started to prepare to go back to the campground the moment I got home. Right as I was opening the door, my little sister came running up to me. She was crying with a black eye. I figured my jerk of a mother must have hit her. I ended up comforting her for a while until she felt better before leaving. It worked out because it started to get dark as I left. Like the night before, I trekked to the lodge and set up camp on the roof. I began to feel the air get cold, followed by a smell. It wasn't unpleasant, but the smell wasn't all that great either. I wanted to see what was going on, but I was nervous, and I hid once I started hearing the footsteps again. This time, I expected it, and I leaned a bit into the hug. For an hour or so, I just rested in the embrace, listening to the cooing here and there. I felt like the arms would rub up and down sometimes, and it was nice. Eventually, it let up and I threw the blanket off of me. I didn't see anyone, but I was greeted by one hell of a sight. It was like I could see every star in the sky through the clearing in the trees that the lodge made. The moon was full and bright, and fireflies lit up the trees. Even though I didn't see anyone, I didn't feel alone. I know it's dumb, but the idea of a ghost didn't pop into my head until recalling the story. I gazed at the stars until I felt it was time to return. Before I left, I brought a flower to the roof and I left it there. It was nice being able to walk back home. I slept like a log and I woke up brighter than ever before. These things started to become a routine. The other kids avoided me more than usual. I would come home to comfort my younger siblings, go to the campground to chill with a ghost and leave a flower before I leave. It wasn't every day, but these were all frequent. It was the first time in a while I was content. Unfortunately, things didn't last. I wanted to leave earlier, so I'd begun to ignore my siblings. Even with the extra time, I would end up spending less time out there with that feeling of being with someone. I was upset that I was losing this connection. I was getting so frustrated that I eventually yelled at my sister to leave me alone one afternoon before leaving. I can remember my older brother's disapproving face in that moment. That night, I felt nothing out in the woods. I brought another flower to the roof, like I'd normally do, to beckon it. Before I could even go up to the ladder, I was hit with an intense cold. A feeling of dread and shame came over me as I looked up the ladder and saw a vague silhouette of a person. There were no features, just an outline. I desperately thought about what I was doing wrong, Maybe it was the shame I was feeling deep down, but I realized, somehow, it was the way I was treating my siblings. It had comforted me like I was supposed to comfort my siblings. While not in a full-blown panic, I returned home with a sense of urgency. The next morning, I remember apologizing to my little sister and giving her a big hug. From that point till we left the house, I made sure to always treat her well. To a lesser extent, my little brother because he was a hearty little asshole, but the same deal. I didn't see it again, and I repressed the memory. My siblings all became close over the years, and my mother eventually passed. The event was bittersweet, remembering the good and the bad that we experienced with her. At the funeral, 
my sister thanked me for being there for her when she needed me. That night, while running outside, I felt a chill over my shoulder, and I could swear I saw that silhouette in the woods. That was last night. I always felt like it was a she, but she was always there for me at a really bad time, and I ended up forgetting about her. While I can't say my life is perfect, she helped me to value my family more. I would like for her to be at peace and pass, or whatever it is ghosts do. If there were any flowers blooming this time of year, I would leave a flower on the side of the road. As autistic as it may sound, I'm probably going to buy some flowers and take them with me on my run. Maybe I'm just a schizo. What do you think I should do? OP here. I'm about to head out for a run now. I bought a bouquet, and I'll take this flower with me. It looks a bit like the wild ones I used to get before. I'll give you guys an update on my return. With all the creepy speculation in this thread, though, I'm going into this a lot more spooked than I thought I would be yesterday. OP here. I'm back. And... Fuck, Anons. I'm feeling a shitload of things right now. I'm going to start green texting now and with the pictures I took. I would be worried about doxing myself, but it was so dark, and my phone is so shit that they aren't all that clear. I'm a bit pissed that lots of the pictures didn't come out well, but I'll post what I got. Anyways, here I go. Be me. A few hours ago from this post. Going on a run at night to get fit and to avoid being seen by my neighbors. The night is pretty, and I don't really like my neighbors. I have a flower tucked in my pants to leave where I, I think I saw it. On my way back, I arrive to where I last thought I saw it. It is an entrance into the thick woods that remained. I was just going to leave the flower on the side of the road and take a picture of it. Maybe it was because I've been reflecting on the situation a lot. Or it was for those sweet use, but I went into the woods to leave it further in. I was surprised to find one of the old campground trails was still visible. If they lasted 15 years when I hung out back there, another 15 years seems reasonable. I tried to use my phone light and picture flash to light up the way. None of the pictures come out with a flash, and my phone light is way too bright for my liking. I ended up using a red light on my house key to lead the way. It's a cold winter night, and I was in a sweat-filled sweatshirt, so... If there were any drops in temp, I sure as hell didn't notice them. The campground was far more exposed with the forest around it shrinking, and the remaining structures were heavily vandalized. Straining my brain to find where the lodge was, I was able to come across within two or so miles of walking. It was at least in one piece, but clearly wrecked. I almost shed a manly tear looking at how bad it looked. While looking around, I admittedly got lost in my memories and I just looked around for a moment. I was reminded why I went back there, as the flower fell from my pants. I was hit with that smell while picking it up off the ground, and with the biggest sigh of my life, I made my way to the roof. I've never felt fear, bar my first contact, when I was around this thing, but you guys filled my head with just enough spooks for me to have to force myself to move. The ladder and tatters was still there under a pile of dirt and leaves, and I'm surprised how much smaller the roof was. I put the flower around where I normally would. Then I laid down with my head, hanging over the peak of the roof. I shut my eyes, and it was like I was reliving my past. I heard the footsteps. It may have been me tripling my size since I was a sub four foot middle schooler, but the steps were light. Light enough for you only to notice them, if you were expecting them. I'm tearing up a little bit writing this part, so I'm sorry for taking so long. From behind, I felt an arm draped over my right shoulder, and another under my left. As incredibly gentle as it was, I can still feel it right now. It was like it was laying on the other side of the roof, with its arms laying on me. No cooing or anything. Even the sounds of the night were gone. I knew the moment I opened my eyes, it would be over, but curiosity got the best of me. My eyes were greeted by the night sky this time, only obstructed by some moisture in my eyes. I got up and was once again surprised. Before me was my old walking stick that I used to use back there, where I left the flower. My older brother made four for each of my siblings and I. 
out of a table that was left behind. Our stash, where we would hide stuff, was looted right before I stopped going back there, and I hadn't seen it since. I was really starting to get cold, as my sweatshirt was now covered in cold sweat. I knew it was time to leave. As I made my way down the stairs, the steps gave out. I was fine, but the same couldn't be said about the ladder. I might be reading into things a bit too much, but I'm pretty sure I'm being told farewell. As I left the area, I noticed the construction vehicles and chopped down trees. The last of this forest I played in as a kid was being prepped for suburban expansion. As I walked out of the tree line, I took one last look into the forest. I saw the silhouette, clearer than ever, kinda. It was still detailless, but, but it felt that I could make expressions out or read its emotions. I'm not quite sure how to explain it, even while it's fresh out of my mind. It was pouting, I think. It then moved into a soft smile, and it faded into the background. I'm still tearing up a bit. Old habits die hard, I guess. I feel very melancholy, I guess. Either way, I think that is the end of this tale. Anyone else ever get ghost calls? I worked suicide prevention for a couple years in the late 90s, and I would get calls that we couldn't trace of people that sounded almost hollow. I don't know how else to describe it other than it sounded like their voice was missing something. Has anyone had a similar experience? I can post stories if it would help connect it to anything. Once back in college in 2016, I was watching one of the Godzilla movies at around 1am when I got a call. I picked up and this female voice that I didn't recognize began talking to me. She knew my name and said we were dating. I thought perhaps it was a girl I met recently or something, so I lied and said that I remembered her. Then she started laughing at me and asked what I was doing. I lied and said I was just asleep. She corrected me by saying I was watching a movie. I asked her who she was and she just kept laughing before the phone cut out. I never heard from her again. On a side note, I'm scared I may have a woman stalking me right now. You should find her and fuck her. The weird demon woman or the current stalker? Demon woman, I'm honestly unsure what that was. Stalker was a swipe match that was super clingy before even meeting up, while adamant that we not meet, and who then demanded a lot of commitments on my part, basically wanting me to promise not to ask out or date for three years. I said fuck off, and she sent me a literal multi-page essay on how I'm horrible. She then, a week later, tried to match with me on a new profile, and has been making new ones to do so over and over again for months now. Frankly, both bitches give me bad vibes. I got calls for over a year from random numbers. I never answered, except once. I looked up one of the numbers on a reserve search, and it came up as a company that sells spoofing services. One of the comments said that these services allow feds and glowies to harass people. I had a dream at about 3 a.m., about a family that burned down in a house, and they all died. I dreamt I was in that house, seeing their shadows running around. I woke up in sweat to see someone calling my phone. It said it was the daughter who had died in the fire at that location. It was a typical female name, and my phone lit up with it. I picked up, and as far as I can recall, it was mostly static. I didn't say anything either. Then, I woke up again, but this time in my actual room, and my phone was locked, and nobody had called. I even checked. Not a phone call to me, but similar. Was parked at my gas station one night delivering something, and my car radio was on since my phone wasn't connected. And I can't remember if it went from static or station, but there was some sort of pause in sound. Then I heard a buzzing, and it sounded like someone picked up a receiver, and the call went like this. Hello? Hey, what's going on? Huh? What are you doing? Huh? Where are you at? At this point, my body is covered in chills and I'm sweating. 
I was already on some weird shit that night, and hearing this made me so paranoid and nervous. Not just the fact that it sounded like I picked up someone's personal phone call from my car, but the way they were talking was so unnerving and uncanny. It sounded like they were both very sleepy and almost moaning their words out, like some zombies trying to speak. I had pulled my phone out to record it and managed to get the last few seconds before it cut off mid-word. It was a boy and girl's voice. I lost a recording, but I showed my friends, and I couldn't get that thought out of my head. It was almost as if it was someone or something trying to mimic some casual conversation. No, just call centers. I've witnessed a bunch of suicides in person, though. I was in the army and then the navy. Guys in there love killing themselves. I've seen two guys shoot themselves in the head. One did it while standing next to me on a range. While living in barracks, I've seen one intentional OD, one guy jump off the roof, and one guy hang himself. I also found one guy that had hung himself after the fact. It was usually all over a girl. I have a burner app that I use to contact an ex during a bad breakup. I know. And sometimes, I get calls on the burner numbers from others that have clearly been called by the same spoofed numbers. Usually, it's people trying to ask to get off a telemarketing list. But one time, it was an angry black woman who was yelling at her boyfriend in the background and calling him a friend while he tried to defend himself. Guess she thought whoever called him from the number was a chick. And when she heard my voice, she just went straight to, This buckaroni gay! Poor dude. Thank you to the guy who hit on me in class. I have changed some small details here, and I'm using a throwaway because I don't want this to ever get traced back to me. When this took place, I, female in my 20s back then, was finishing my degree in the city and working as a casual receptionist at a firm. One of the employees, Nick, told me one day that one of his clients, who he said was a stand-up guy, thought I was very cute and wanted to see if I'd be okay to give him my number. We went to dinner, and he was charming enough. He was in the medical field, and was about seven years older, but I didn't mind, as my own parents had a similar age gap between them. We talked about my studies, and he told me he thought my rather run-of-the-mill family life was amazing, because his life was so different. He was adopted as a baby, and his father was abusive. When he was 15, his mother left and he never saw her after that. He was kicked out at 18 and ended up in a terrible car accident in his early 20s. For a long time, he stayed at a relative's house and worked to support himself. Yeah, heavy conversation on the first date, but all I felt was this overwhelming compassion for this poor human who had been through so much. He seemed nice, he was smart, handsome, and though he was just a touch too serious, given his life, I figured that would be understandable. We ended up dating, but by about the third week, things started feeling a bit weird. He refused to introduce me to any of his friends because his last ex had left him for a friend. He also hated that I had male friends because of the same reason, and he would insist on reading any texts that I sent or that I received from them. I made excuses in my head for him like, Oh, people need to heal, or sometimes they need a crutch before they learn to trust. Or, well, it's not like I have anything to hide. He started being critical of the way I spoke or acted, and how I dressed. He was also super insistent that we move in together, but I felt it was way too soon. In arguments, sometimes he would get a weird look in his eyes that made me feel unsettled. And I once tried to break the tension by half-joking, you look like you want to hit me, to which he responded. I wouldn't bother if it came to that. I would just kill you. I was so shocked. I didn't even react to that until days later. Recounting it, red flags were everywhere. But though it might be hard to believe, I was actually convinced I was falling in love with him. Most of the time, he was perfect, until he wasn't. But he would explain that was only because he had so many issues from his past, and I would believe him. 
Then, one day, I told him what I thought was a funny story about a random guy in my class who asked for my number. This guy had asked under the guise of getting notes for classes that he'd missed, but I only offered my college email address, explaining that I had a boyfriend. Hilariously, as soon as class ended, I saw this guy annoyedly throwing the paper I wrote my email on in the bin on his way out of the lecture hall. I expected my boyfriend to laugh, but he lost it. He accused me of leading the guy on, accused me of wanting to cheat. I was furious because I knew I had done nothing wrong. When he angrily threw a mug at the wall, which shattered, the whole argument came to an abrupt halt. I was scared and angry, so I grabbed my bag and bolted out of his apartment. I thought he would stop me, but he didn't. I went home and cried about it to my cousin who I was living with and assumed it was over. Days pass and I hear nothing from him. And within those days, I started questioning everything. Suddenly, it was clear as day that this relationship was toxic and very unhealthy. Even if he did have a tough past, it wasn't my job to fix it and it wasn't an excuse for the way he treated me. I was starting to accept that this was just a horrible near miss and to get over it when he texted me, groveling apologies and how much he missed me and I made the mistake of responding. He called and I picked up, but it was because I wanted to tell him that I still thought it wasn't going to work out. He cried, he yelled at me, he asked me how I could do this to him when I knew that everyone he loved in his life had abandoned him. How could I do the same? He told me he would never be able to love again and that it was all my fault. I had broken him. He told me that he had given me everything, but I was leaving over such a small argument. And then he apologized and told me that he was trying to change and to give him another chance. I was bawling my eyes out. I felt like the worst human in the world, but I held tight to saying that it was best if we moved on and that I was sorry. He ended the call by telling me that I had ruined his life. Nothing happened for a while except for texts here and there where my ex would apologize, tell me that he missed me, explain that he realized he made so many mistakes, etc. and etc. I would tell my cousin who I was living with about him and she would firmly tell me to not respond. She was sure it would stop eventually. And one day, I finished work as usual and headed to the station. It was a busy day and the streets were scattered with other people. As I walked, I had this weird urge to look behind me. And when I did, I saw my ex. There was a little distance behind between me and him. But when I saw him, our eyes locked. He looked different, a bit out of it. And I thought maybe he was drunk. I decided I would deal with him at the train station as it was always crowded, and I wanted to talk to him only in a place where there were lots of people. I figured the yelling and crying would not be as intense that way. When I reached the station, I stopped and waited for him to catch up to me. He stopped about two feet away, and I expected him to start apologizing again, but he said nothing. He just stared at me. Awkward seconds pass, and I say, look, insert name, but that's all I got out before his arm moved slightly as he took his hand half out of his pocket and I saw he was holding a very small knife. I froze and vaguely remember thinking that I wanted to run, but it was like my brain and body shut down. I can only describe it as if there was a fog in my brain and I just could not move for what felt like ages. I just stared at him and I still remember how his eyes just looked so blank. I don't know how long that lasted, but then, without saying anything, he turned and left. Nobody else had noticed. I remember numbly getting on the train. I started second guessing if that even happened. Hindsight tells me that I was in shock. As soon as I got home though, I burst into tears. My cousin calmed me down and helped me call the police. And in the end, the security cameras weren't placed in a spot that could clearly show that he had a weapon so the police couldn't do much. Thankfully, I didn't see my ex again. I ended up quitting my job, changing my number, and I eventually moved away to another city. To my ex, let's never ever meet.
and to the guy who asked for my number in class. Thank you. You might have saved my life, and you have definitely changed it. People who know murderers. Were there any signs that something was off? If so, what were they? I've posted about it before, but a kid down the street talked about killing squirrels for fun. He was seven years old. He moved away and we forgot about him. 20 years later, we saw him in the news for brutally killing his parents. My brothers will sometimes share the story of their limited interactions with Michael Swanson. Back in the 90s, our grandparents had bought a cabin in northern Minnesota as a summer home. Each year, we would go up and stay at the lake for a week. There weren't a lot of kids at the lake, as it was mostly people like my grandparents who lived there, retired with a summer home. But there was one family with a son who went by Mikey. They lived on the same side of the lake as my grandparents, and would often come over to help with projects or to have a barbecue. Now, my grandmother felt that something was off with Mikey, but couldn't place her finger on what exactly it was. Grandpa just thought he was a little odd. In fact, that is part of why his parents had bought the cabin. They thought it would be good for Mikey to spend more time in nature and less time in the city. Anyways, Grandma never really was comfortable with us playing with Mikey, unless it was at my grandparents' cabin. One time, my brothers were out on the dock fishing, and Mikey came running down the bank, telling them that they needed to come with him. He had something cool to show them. They went with Mikey over towards his folks' cabin, where he had trapped a rabbit in a snare. My oldest brother asked him if he was going to let it go, and Mikey laughed and said, Well, that wouldn't be very fun. I don't have all the details, but I know that Mikey proceeded to torture this rabbit in various ways. My oldest brother, who would have been about 14, lied and told my older brother, 11, that he had heard grandma yelling for them and that they needed to go back. They went back and never said anything about it to anyone until years later, when both were studying criminal psychology in college. Michael Swanson went on to murder two gas station clerks about 12 years after the rabbit incident. I spent a lot of time at a friend's house when I was about six to nine years old. He had a brother who was like three years older than us, who I remember as being generally nice, but I have one weird memory of him, absolutely losing his shit when he tried to teach me and his brother to rollerblade, and I couldn't get it. Like, he was throwing things and weeping uncontrollably. When I was in high school, I found out that he had joined the military, and while he was deployed, he got court-martialed for killing civilians and keeping body parts like fingers and ears as trophies. I knew a girl as a freshman in college who was mean, obviously mentally unstable and not too bright. When her fraternal twin sister fell in love with a good friend of mine, she became enraged with jealousy and could not let it go. Her sister begged her to get help and there was a huge blowout in a hallway on campus where my friend had to intervene to prevent his girlfriend from getting stabbed by her sister. The police were called to campus and she spent a week in jail before her sister decided to not press charges. Her remaining friends dropped out of her life because of her actions and unwillingness to get help. She got kicked out of college shortly after threatening the guidance counselor who was giving her one last chance and she moved back in with her parents. When her sister went home for Christmas with my friend, to introduce him to her parents. I told him to watch his back. They haven't even made it all the way into the house before they were attacked and repeatedly stabbed. My friend died on the porch and she died at the hospital the next day. The murderous sister was beaten to death in a jail fight a few days later. I met their older brother, who I didn't even know existed, at the funeral for the good sister. He said he had gone no contact with the family years before for his own protection, because his parents refused to do anything about the mental health problems that his little sister always had, even as a small child. Rest in peace, Derek. I miss you, buddy. Edit. I started college in the 80s. Time does heal, but rarely completely. Thank you for the condolences. Mental health resources were scarce and highly stigmatized back then. 
and I hope that anyone going through something similar gets the help they need. I've met several after the fact, but this is about one I met weeks before the murder. My then husband and I were hanging out and met up with a friend of his and the friend's girlfriend. The friend gets a call from his brother and invites him to join us. The brother arrives and pretty soon afterwards, the whole vibe changed. My ex knew both men since all three were kids, so he was relaxed enough to start drinking around them. I was babysitting a wine cooler because I'm the next thing to a teetotaler, and I was a designated driver. I kept noticing the brother staring at me, but I tried to ignore it, but it quickly became very uncomfortable. I'm nothing special to look at facially. I got the mom bot on lock, and I was with my husband. The brother then asks me why I'm not drinking. I explained that I'm not a real drinker and added that I like to be aware of who and what's around me. So, he asked my husband why I wasn't drinking. I don't remember his response, but the dude looks at me and says, We need to get you drunk. I left to go sit in the car because what the fuck was that? I didn't feel safe or protected because my ex wasn't even paying attention. About 20 minutes later, the dude walks up to my car and asks if I can take him to the corner store. I reminded him that he had a car, and he replied that he couldn't drive because he had been drinking. I told him I wouldn't take him, which led to us staring at each other in silence for several moments. He broke the silence by saying, I bet you're real loyal. A loyal girl. A good girl. I know that motherfucker gets anything he wants from you. Then, he laughed and walked away. When I told my ex the next day, he wasn't bothered and was making excuses for the friend's brother's behavior. A few weeks later, there was a report on the news about the body of a woman being found in my ex's old neighborhood. Find out later, she was assaulted and murdered. It didn't take long to find and arrest her killer, aka the friend's brother. I knew Christopher Bennett as a child. Honestly, I thought he was a bit of a jerk. Then again, most little boys are mean to little girls, especially little girls who are three years younger than them and seem to think they can do whatever the boys are doing. Last time I saw him, we had grown up a little. I was 11 and he was about 14. He wasn't as mean as I had remembered him. Did I see it coming? No, most people didn't. I mean, he was getting into trouble a lot, but murder? Never thought he had it in him. Then again, he was right to kill the bastard he did, and I think a lot of other people would become murderers if they saw what he did. In 2003, he murdered his mother's boyfriend. He was 18 at the time. He broke into his mom's house with the intention of robbing the place. What he found was his little half-sister getting assaulted by her father, Chris's mom's boyfriend. Chris ended up with one hell of a long prison sentence, something like 1,500 plus years for ridding the world of a child molester. His sisters have since grown up and have been speaking out, and they have been fighting to get their brother out of prison for a number of years. For four years, I worked four desks away from someone who was arrested and convicted of a 32-year-old cold case murder. Dude was an asshole, but didn't give off murder vibes. The general reaction was, huh, I hope his replacement is less of a dick. One of my uncles murdered his wife. He was out of jail by the time I was a kid. Yes, there was always something off about him. My mother told me he was always violent and had a sadistic streak. He liked to make people afraid. He mellowed out as he got older, but he was always a user and always looking to take advantage of where he could. I'm pretty sure he was a sociopath. My mother had a lot of siblings, and he was the only one like this. Why did your parents let him anywhere near you? I couldn't say. His siblings loved him and just tolerated or were in denial about what a really bad person he was. Fun fact, he married again to his brother's ex-wife. I have cousins that I have no idea whose kids they are. I knew someone who killed her mother. No, absolutely no warning at all. No hints to look back on and say that we should have seen it coming. She was a perfectly average suburban wife and mother who woke up one day 
and Snapped. She ended up being featured on Snapped. She's currently serving out a 40-year term. I know a similar story. Thank God her mother survived, though. She was a very fragile, almost tiny woman with a quiet, high-pitched voice. Her nickname was something like Mouse. She was temporarily living with her mother after her divorce, just for a few months. And one day, she suddenly stabbed her own mother six times in the back. The knife wasn't very big, so the mother survived. The daughter went to an institution for having a psychotic break, and her mother forgave her instantly, visited her every day as soon as she could leave the hospital. It was heartbreaking to see how much both of them suffered, and they seemed as loving as any family I've ever known. The mom, never for a second, thought her daughter actually wanted to do her any harm. As someone who has witnessed psychosis firsthand, fortunately, not in a form dangerous to anyone but the person suffering from it, I applaud the mother. It's truly horrifying how the brain can make you believe stuff, be totally certain of things, even in plain sight of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. My wife suffered from psychosis and believed that she and our children were in danger by some imaginary black men. They were with my mother at the time, so I caught her and let my wife speak to my mother. She could hear the children in the background while talking to my mother, who constantly was telling her that everything's fine. The moment the call ended, she said that they are in danger, and it was a ruse from those black men. She is better now. My former manager killed his wife and attempted to make it look like a suicide. He did this because he was ultra-religious and cheating on his wife with multiple women he found online. The church he was a member of frowned upon divorce. So, he thought murder would be a better alternative. The story has been on Dateline and other shows. He was a super strange dude, and when I found out, I wasn't completely surprised. His office always smelled like farts, 